Hello everybody, my name is Joe Scott. I'm the president and CEO of Jersey City Medical Center and Liberty Health, and welcome to the Medical Center Show. Uh, February is Heart Month, and so today we have with us Dr. Tyrone Krauss, our premier um, chief of cardiovascular surgery. And Dr. Krauss, tell us a little about yourself and when you came to the Medical Center and why you chose to come to Jersey City. Yeah. Well, thank you, Joe. Uh, uh, my training uh, started uh, 17 years, uh, w w well, took 17 years. I uh, went to NYU undergrad and then I went to medical school at New York Medical College. So from college till you were done your cardiovascular residency, cardiovascular surgery residency, it took 17 years? Wow, took I never realized years. that. Wow. Um, well, like I said, uh, the undergraduate in medical right. school, and then uh, there was uh, nine years of actual surgery training. Wow. Because you have to go through a general surgery training first, and then I finished So up. you completed a general surgery residency, and then you did a cardiovascular surgery residency? That's, right, that's correct. And, uh, and that's the requirement to get into or be eligible to get a fellowship for cardiac surgery, cardiothoracic okay. and surgery. And where did you do your training? And I did my cardiothoracic training at New York Hospital in oh, you did. Uh, Cornell. So again, we have all these great New York doctors on our who got trained in New York and now are at Jersey City Medical Center. There's really no reason to go into the city for their health care, right? Absolutely none. We have uh, a beautiful brand new facility. It's, it's a new facility. Uh, it's state of the art uh, cardiac surgery. We have a 24 7 in house cardiac surgery team. Right. All designated cardiac anesthesiologists. Uh, and we'll talk about this a little more later. Sure. Uh, but uh, it's just a full complement of whatever it takes to uh, the full gamut of uh, cardiac surgery from coronary bypass surgery to valve surgery to heart failure surgery to arrhythmia surgery and aneurysm surgery. And again, we'll probably talk about this a little more in detail, right. but that's the general uh, idea uh, uh, that we uh, put forth at, at the uh, medical center. So we, we, before we were talking with our chief of cardiology and she talked about some of the things associated with heart disease and congestive heart failure and how we treat that. Tell us a little bit about why does somebody go for open heart surgery? Can't they just, can't the cardiologist just take care of them? And what makes them come to you? And, and you know, what's that all about? How come? Well, you know, you're right. It, it, there are a lot less patients going to surgery compared right. to, say, 10 years ago. Coronary bypass, uh, not as many patients uh, go to surgery. And for the reason that she probably, she probably gave it, she must have gone over a lot of the cholesterol medications, right. which more and more... Uh, uh, we believe is lo are lowering the uh, plaques and the, the arteries that cause the blockages. Uh, and uh, there are other medications. Uh, and then there are also procedures. The interventional cardiologist that she mentioned is a person who, in the cath lab, without going to surgery, puts a, a wire down the coronary artery right. and is able to open up this artery. So, so they don't need surgery they if they won't can need do surgery. that. That's okay. right. So when do they come to you? So they come to us when basically they can't do anything else. Oh, uh, they've I see. really run to the end of medicine and angioplasty, this balloon angioplasty. Uh, if they have a blockage in a certain area of the heart, uh, for example, uh, if this is a model of the heart, mm -hmm. uh, if the blockage is up in the middle of the, uh, the main artery on the left side, it's called the left main artery. Uh, in this country, at least, uh, the first line treatment is surgery. It's okay. too risky to do a balloon angioplasty. So there are certain blockages that just can't be done in the oh, cath Okay, lab. so explain that to me. So you say if they've got a blockage here, mm -hmm. it's too risky to just put a stent in and just open it up. That's well, correct. What, what's the risk? Okay, the risk uh, for uh, the left main artery supplies about two-thirds to three-quarters of the blood supply of your heart. Mm -hmm. And there is a risk of the, the stent not working. Oh, okay. uh, it may be anywhere from 1% to 5% uh, that may disclose, regardless of what you do. spontaneously just... It may either spontaneously or a week or two later or a month later or six wow. months later. So in a relatively short period of time, it could close. And the reasons for that are multiple, but in general, if, if uh, the lesion or the blockage uh, is complicated or complex, uh, the risk may be higher for uh, blocking. Okay. So if you, just think about it, if you have three quarters of your blood supply up here and the, uh, uh, the uh, stent closes, that stops the blood supply to three quarters of your heart. And wow. what happens when that happens is your heart just stops. Oh my so gosh. There, the mortality rate would be too high. So, so those people, reason. somebody could go home with one of those stents and then just have a sudden cardiac arrest and that would be it for them. And that would be it for so them. That, so when doctors see that kind of lesion, 
they go, they call you and say, hey, you yes. need to take care of this guy. Yes, there are selected, selected times when they may do an angioplasty to that right. if they feel the patient is not a surgical candidate. They have uh, cancer, for example, that's right. advanced, or multiple other medical problems, or I say see. they're uh, uh, too old and frail to withstand surgery. Uh, then they would get an angioplasty to that. Right. But most patients are robust enough to undergo general surgery to have. And uh, just if I can uh, uh, mention a little bit about the actual surgery yeah. compared to say even 10 and 20 years ago. I got started 20 years ago. It was a much more invasive procedure. Right. Now uh, with the techniques advanced, the surgery, is, uh, the incisions are smaller, the incisions are smaller uh, uh, from your lower extremities, the, uh, there are different techniques uh, not going on the heart-lung machine compared to on-pump, right. uh, off-pump. Uh, <clears throat> so, so some people, you actually work on the heart while it's still beating? Yes. Okay, uh, so that's called? That's called off-pump surgery. Off-pump surgery. And, and how often do you do that? Uh, again, it's selective. Uh, yeah. uh, at the medical center, uh, probably about 30% of our patients uh, we feel can have uh, off pump safely. Okay. Uh, and uh, just think about it a bit. Uh, the heart lung machine was really invented to operate on the heart because, as you know, the heart pumps blood. Right. You make a hole in the heart, the blood's going to splatter all right. over the place, and you're not going to be able to do the surgery. Right. So the heart lung machine replaces the heart during that time wow. you're doing the surgery. I see. And it really helped us uh, back in the late 60s, 1960s, when coronary bypass, for example, got started uh, to do the actual surgery because right. you, you know, it allows us to slow the heart rate down or stop it and to do a suture uh, bypass right. uh, in a bloodless field. Sure. So when you think about on uh, off-pump bypass, the heart is beating. How, how are you, how how are you actually that? suturing to, right. to uh, the, the and heart? And so how do you do that? And so what we do is we have uh, uh, stabilizers. And basically what they are is it, this little arms of, uh, made out of padding. And we actually place them against the beating heart. And that little area, that area uh, that we're going to do the bypass to, is rendered stationary. Wow. So that little area is not moving. Right. And uh, we and then, pull up loops in order to uh, help minimize the blood flow during that procedure. It takes about five to 10 minutes to do a bypass. That I, one I hear you're area, really great at it, too. Well, I don't know. I mean, uh, I, I survive, <laughs> I guess. Uh, but uh, it's like anything else. You wouldn't survive long if you yeah. weren't good. And, and so tell, so when you talk about bypass surgery, you're actually bypassing the vessel. That's why they call it bypass. You're bypassing, like you're going around that vessel that's blocked. Yeah. And I, are you taking a vessel from somewhere else, or how's that? Yeah. What we do is, it's kind of, I'm just a glorified, a glorified uh, plumber. Oh, a plumber. Uh, basically, okay. uh, that's if a good way a to think of it. Yeah, yeah. it's a, a human plumber. Right. If you have a blockage in the coronary, uh, we don't cut it out. Because I get this question all the time right. from patients. Do you cut that out? What do you do with that blockage? Is right. it going to stay there? The blockage stays there. And basically, uh, what we do, uh, we get a new pipe. Right. And uh, in uh, medical terms, we get a vein from your leg. Right. We make a small incision like this, and we're able to, in the past, we had to open up your leg all the way down to your ankle. Right. Now we, all, we, we could do uh, what is called endoscopic surgery, where we make a small incision, and we take the vein out. Or there's an artery underneath the breastbone. It's called the internal mammary artery. Right. And again, looking at the model, uh, the, uh, this is a, um, if you... Um, Imagine that these are the uh, coronaries. This is your heart, right. and the arteries that we're bypassing on the surface of the heart, just like this. Oh, okay. this is about the size of the uh, the heart, of the also. Heart. Okay. And uh, imagine this being a, a vein that we just took out from your leg, and we suture it. Now, again, imagine there's a blockage, say here in this right. coronary artery. So, say the blockage is there, we'll suture this beyond it like that. So oh. it's just like a bypass. So it bypasses where the blockage is. Just simply That's bypasses. That's why they call it, it bypass surgery. Yes. Huh. That's very very interesting. That's. Uh, that's pretty amazing. Now, when you take this thing out of their leg, doesn't that doesn't that become a problem? I mean, don't they have to worry about blood flow in their leg, or what's the what's yeah. the deal? Well, when I when I teach the students, uh, I usually tell them that God put superficial veins in the leg, anticipating that someday there would that be heart surgery. Be a heart surgery. So <laughs> that's uh, base, So so there are there are deep deep veins in your leg, and there are superficial veins, and the superficial. Unless there's, uh, unless you have a problem with your lower extremities. So you're like not taking like the femoral artery out of their leg. You're just taking a vein that's that's on the surface. Yeah. Is right. that what it's that on is? the surface and it's virtually not needed. 
Okay. Do they get like a scar or do they, what's? Uh, well, uh, like I said, uh, 20 years ago, we used to open up your, from the groin all the way down to your right. ankle. Now we're only, we're able to take the whole vein out by making a small incision. Wow. Uh, and you hardly see this uh, incision. Yeah. Well over 90% of our patients were able to uh, do this endoscopic vein harvest, it's called. Wow. Wow, that's great. Now, um, since you've come to the medical center, you've done an awful lot of surgery. H how many surgeries will you do every year? Uh, well, we're Personally, trying to increase like, it. Uh -huh. uh, when I, uh, before I retired, I always like to say, uh, uh, <laughs> 10 years ago, I used to do six to 700 operations a year myself. Wow, wow. Uh, when I first came to the medical center, we did a little over 100. We're doing, uh, last year we did, we doubled that. We did right. 215, and we're targeted probably to do closer to 300 uh, this year. So we'll do So we're three. really growing uh, at the medical center. That's right. And all the, we talked a little bit about, like, the specialists that need to be there. You, you need a bunch of, you need a team, right, that really, works not only on the patient in surgery, but after surgery, I mean, how's that all work? Yeah. I, that, that to me is probably the most important part. Uh, just the other day, I uh, transferred a patient from an out, outlying hospital, and the family was asking me about, uh, about that specifically. Right. They said, we checked you out, we went on the computer, and we saw you're a good guy, but what about the team? Because right. we know uh, the, a good portion of the surgery uh, is related to the aftercare. Absolutely. We have designated anesthesiologists, uh, the people who put you to sleep in the operating room, uh, just designated for cardiac surgery. And, and do they have special uh, training? Do they, they have special, they have, uh, special training, uh, uh, an extra year of anesthesia where they just do really? uh, a fellowship in cardiac surgery. Wow. And uh, then we also have physician's assistants that are designated just for cardiac surgery. And not only are they uh, just for cardiac surgery, but they're in the hospital 24 hours a day. Oh, I see. Uh, we've had uh, 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 any question by a, a nurse uh, or uh, one of the other ancillary people they are there to, to at the bedside taking care of problems in close contact with the surgeon. So they're always in touch with you if anything happens and they can get a hold of you right away. Yes. Yeah. And then we also have uh, probably the most important part. I can't forget the nurses. Uh, yes. They're probably the Absolutely. most important part of the, they, of the they, team. <laughs> Listen, if you forget the nurses, oh, you're in big trouble, I'm done. brother. <laughs> I'm done. You know? That, that is they're, true. They're kind of that machine that kind of keeps everything yeah. flowing. Absolutely. So. And we have great critical care nurses, right? I mean, uh, Excellent. Uh, it's expanded since I've gotten there and uh, we're, we're growing. We, right. uh, uh, actually, next month we have our own designated ICU uh, just for cardiac surgery. So we've grown so much, we have a cardiac surgery ICU. So we'll probably call it this cardiovascular ICU, and, and that, that's a great thing. Yes. Yeah. Uh, we're here with Dr. Tyrone Kraus, the Chief of Cardiovascular Surgery at Jersey City Medical Center, and we'll be right back after this break. Jersey City Medical Center, Hudson County's number one hospital, as ranked by U.S. News and World Report. Hudson County's only hospital to receive an A safety score rating. Jersey City Medical Center is Hudson County's only hospital to receive the prestigious Magnet Award for Nursing Excellence. Make the number one hospital in Hudson County your first choice for quality health care. Jersey City Medical Center. Visit us on the web at libertyhealth.org. Seeing the ER doctor at the Jersey City Medical Center has never been easier. If you're sick, you just click. Go to libertyhealth.org, and here's how it works. Click Skip the Wait. Select your time and check in now. Enter your symptoms, your personal information. Click Proceed to Confirmation, and the doctor's waiting for you. The Jersey City Medical Center. Make Hudson County's number one hospital your first choice. It takes more than a state-of-the-art medical facility to make a great hospital. It takes a team of dedicated medical professionals. That's the Jersey City Medical Center, Hudson County's number one hospital. Medical teams consisting of New Jersey's top doctors, magnet award-winning nurses, and accomplished hospital associates, all committed to your good health. That's what you have at the Jersey City Medical Center. Make Hudson County's number one hospital your first choice. The Jersey City Medical Center, on the web at libertyhealth.org. 
Hi, Joe Scott, the president of Jersey City Medical Center, here with the Medical Center Show and with Dr. Krauss, our chief of cardiovascular surgery. Uh, we were talking a little bit about cardiac surgery, and you explained bypass. Uh, there's other kinds of cardiac surgery that you do, right? T tell us a little bit about that. Yes, at the medical center, we do basically uh, all heart surgery except for transplant, uh, it, with, and that consists in valve surgery, which is probably the second most common uh, surgery we do besides bypass. Uh, valve surgery, usually the aortic and mitral valve, and uh, occasionally we'll operate on uh, a tricuspid valve, but for the most part, that's the... Uh, and. and uh, aortic valve uh, surgery, for example, uh, uh, it could occur in a patient that's 40 years old up to uh, 90 years old. So wh uh, why do they get that? Is it is there something wrong with most their valve or something? Th yep. Um, and, and the valve is the thing that kind of opens and closes? Is that the, the, uh, there are four valves to the heart. Right. Uh, just to show again, uh, the mitral valve uh, runs, is the, this is the mitral valve, wow. separates the left atrium from the left ventricle. Uh, the aortic valve is up here. And uh, those are the two main valves that have uh, stress from, uh, sometimes even from birth. A person, for example, may have mitral valve prolapse, okay. uh, maybe 2% of the population uh, with that. And uh, eventually, a small portion of those patients could develop surgery. Uh, the aortic valve, you could be 50 years old and have a blocked valve. It's called aortic stenosis. Okay. Uh, very commonly, uh, we operate on that. Uh, I just saw a patient today, 45 years old. She had a congenital problem with her aortic valve. So it's a pretty when, common... When you say congenital, that means from birth? From birth, she had... Uh, normally, there are three leaflets to the valve. She was born with two. Oh Again, about 2% of the patient uh, and, population and will have that. And how old was she when she came to you? Uh, just the other day. She's 45 years old. So did she not know that this was going on? She or knew she... she uh, it's one of those things where you've heard, and most a lot of people will say, you know, my doctor, when I was uh, five years old, said I had a murmur. Right. Almost always you, you outlive it and, you know, outgrow yeah. it. And uh, in her case, uh, that murmur was something that was physically wrong, and she just did not outgrow it, and it wow. turned into a blocked valve. Wow. So, uh, uh, and again, you, the, uh, some of the symptoms, uh, which were, I know, uh, briefly talked about in your uh, cardiology uh, segment, mm -hmm. was, are going to be shortness of breath. Right. And sometimes you could have chest pain, uh, uh, like a heaviness on your chest. Wow. Um, and... Um, Sometimes you see swollen ankles, uh, right. these general symptoms of congestive heart failure. Right. Uh, the other uh, type of surgery we do is aneurysm surgery. An aneurysm is a weakening in the wall of the uh, artery. Uh, if this, uh, this is the aorta right. uh, going all the way around, sometimes this gets to be a certain uh, size. It's kind of like a bubble there? Just a bubble. Uh, it's just uh, similar to a, a balloon. If a balloon blows up, it gets to a certain uh, critical size and it'll just spontaneously rupture. Uh, this artery, if it gets to be a certain size, now how do you have that, or how do you how and, do you get and that? Does it does it rupture, or do we find it? Like, didn't we we just had a patient come into the emergency department uh, probably a year ago? She was actually pregnant, and she was complaining of this pain. And apparently, the echo tech, the echocardiographic tech, picked up on ult, on ultrasound, or I guess or through the echo, that she had this thing. And what happened? She was she was like six months pregnant. I think I think we operated on her, and uh, she had a, a special type of aorta uh, uh, aortic problem. It's called an aortic dissection, uh, where basically, and it's it's interesting that she had she was uh, uh, pregnant, and uh, occasionally a pregnant uh, woman will get hypertension. The blood pressure oh. will go up, which is a known cause uh, for an aortic dissection. Wow. Uh, John Ritter from Three's Company, if yeah, you remember, yeah, yeah, he yeah, had yeah. an aortic dissection. He actually died yes. when he got to the hospital. Yeah. It's, a, it's a lethal disease, but wow. sometimes you can get to the hospital uh, quick enough to get operated on. Wow. And usually the symptom is it feels like somebody's stabbing you in the back. Wow. Because uh, literally the wall of the aorta splits down the middle. Oh, my God. And it actually just runs all the way around. Uh, if you can get to the hospital uh, alive uh, there's, and, and stable, there's a good chance you could survive the surgery. Right. And she was fortunate enough to uh, get to the hospital. Well, and if I remember correctly, we took her to the operating room and then we had a team. We had the OB team come in, the obstet obstetricians came in, they took the baby, it was only like six months, the baby survived and the mom survived. I think everybody did really, really well. Key uh, is being at a hospital, and she was fortunate enough to be at a hospital that, uh, like, like the medical center, right. that has all of these other specialties. Wow. Not just cardiac surgery, but as you mentioned, uh, OBGYN, right. so that uh, uh, specific care could be uh, given to the uh, 
the baby. Wow, that's amazing. Um, when we get, we have patients in the hospital, we obviously want to prepare them for surgery. So you give them this booklet, you actually, uh, it says going for heart surgery, what you need to know. Is this something you developed or was this a team that did it or? It, it was, it was uh, not just me, but the team. Mm -hmm. And uh, again, the, the nursing staff uh, who, uh, who deal with uh, the patients uh, over the years, uh, come up with a number of questions that the patients okay, will ask. Okay, so this is kind of like the frequently asked questions for open heart surgery, right? Exactly. Only it's, it's frequently asked, but only uh, in addition they put it in pictorial form. Okay. So to add a little humor, they'll they'll uh, show you, for example, a picture of a, a heart, which is right. supposed to be the patient, and uh, you'll see the patient here smoking. Right. Smoking, as you know, is a, is a risk factor. Uh, just on the cover, you see the patient going to the hospital to get open heart surgery. And you see the suitcase with a little vein uh, coming out, <laughs> uh, anticipating that the vein is oh, going to be used okay. uh, for the surgery. Right. But it also gives you a lot of other uh, just simple, in pictorial form, easy to remember. And uh, the biggest problem that patients will have is the apprehension prior to sure. surgery, not knowing what to expect. Sure. And, uh, it and this kind of helps alleviate well, their fears and uh, let them ex expect what's going to happen to well, them. Yeah, exactly. And just to give you another example, uh, one of the uh, most frequently asked questions and, and problems and things that people remember after surgery are uh, remembering what their loved one looked like after the surgery in the intensive care because they're able to see the patient afterwards. So we have a picture in here and it shows that there's a, a patient uh, connected to all sorts of tubes and, and uh, it just looks like uh, yeah, a disaster. Yeah. But if you know that beforehand, that what to expect, then it's it not certainly allays all their fears the and, and it's much better on the families of, uh, of everyone. So, so tell me, what, what's the course of, you know, somebody comes in for open heart surgery, do they come in the day of surgery or the day before? How long do they stay? Well, what's their clinical course yeah. like? In general, most of the patients that we see for open heart surgery are patients that have to stay in the hospital. Uh, they're diagnosed by the cardiologist and they have to stay in the hospital because it'd be too risky to go home. Okay. But we do have about 25 to 30 percent of the patients will be seen electively. I'll see them in my office right. and then we'll decide a week, two weeks from now, they'll come in the morning right. and we actually do the surgery that day. The hospitals stay, the average length, uh, and we're ranked second or third in, in, the, in the state. Right. Uh, for length of stay, which is between four and five days. Wow. Uh, so after they have that complete surgery, they're out in four or five days? That's correct. Wow, that's, that's terrific. Correct. That's we do, uh, uh, this woman that I mentioned earlier, uh, that we're going to do this minimally invasive aortic valve mm -hmm. uh, surgery on, this, the incision is going to be seven centimeters. Wow. It's going to be the smallest incision. Uh, and uh, there are selected And you do that patients. on the be beating heart? This so is the one where she needs a valve, so it can't be done on oh, a beating heart. Okay. But certainly uh, uh, we offer that as, a, uh, as part of uh, valve surgery. Wow. Uh, many, many pa patients now are asking for it. The elective patients especially are candidates for this. If it's an emergency or an urgent case, she, they, you may, yeah. might not be a, a candidate for this smaller incision. Right. But certainly uh, the elective patients are. Now. When, so they have surgery today. Are they sitting up tomorrow? Are they? I mean, what's what? what can you, what? Yeah. When do they start walking around and say, "Okay, I'm ready to go home"? Yeah. Again, uh, going back to the the excellent nursing care, we get patients in the chair the next day, right. out of bed. Uh, really? Off of, the majority of the uh, tubes are out. Within 24 so hours. Within 24 wow. hours, That's they're great. pretty much uh, getting around. Right. The minimally invasive surgery, two or three days, even uh, they're going really? home. Really? Wow. That's amazing. Uh, some patients opt to go to rehab, uh, re uh, like a rehabilitation center right. for cardiac surgery. Uh, most patients would rather go home. It's not necessary. Not most necessary to go to rehab. They can they can go directly to home. That's correct. And most do they need home health or anything? Or uh, some do. Uh -huh. uh, not everyone uh, does. Uh, some of the uh, patients uh, who have orthopedic uh, problems before surgery may want to have a home health aide right. come in once a day for a few weeks right. uh, to get them along. Uh, help them with their medication. Right. Um, and so that, so we've got a specialized team of nurses for after surgery and they know exactly how to take care of all the patients there, try to get them out of bed as soon as they can and they're usually home in four to five days unless they're minimally invasive and then it's less than that. That's, that's correct. That's pretty amazing. Yeah. That's, uh, and like I said before, it's, it's uh, amazing. It's 20, like I said, 20 years ago, it was uh, a lot. Uh, yeah. The average hospital stay was 10 days. Wow. So, uh, and the average incision was uh, a foot and a half long. Oh now everything is much smaller. Wow. And uh, the um, uh, mortality rates uh, in general uh, for uh, a coronary bypass 
uh, the average patient has a risk of 1%, a 99% chance of everything going fine. Wow, that's Valve great. Valve surgery, uh, it's 97 to 99%. Wow. Everything going fine. That's amazing. So there's really no reason. I mean, it's, at, it's riskier to do nothing. It's right. riskier just to continue to treat with medicine. Right. So uh, whenever you uh, talk to patients, uh, the, the key thing is try to allay that, that fear of uh, the risk. Right. Okay, so now I'm home I'm after my five days stay in the, in the hospital. Now what? What do I, do? can I run around the block? Can I, you know, what, what am I, <laughs> what's my next well, That's step? a good question. I, in general, uh, at the initial interview when I'm talking to patients, I'll say it takes a couple of months to get back to, to baseline and perfect. I don't okay. like to sugarcoat it. It's a serious well, it's operation. Painful too, right? I mean, it's painful, it's, yeah. uh, and uh, you're not going to be playing golf in two right. or three months, for example. You're not oh, going to drive a car for Tyrone, two or three weeks. If I have to have surgery, I got to get back to the golf course, yeah. man. You well, know, that's well, then <laughs> you're going to have to have a minimally invasive okay. uh, procedure, right. well, that, that, and then you yeah. can get back sooner. All right, good. There you go. Uh, so, uh, but I think it's important that uh, you try to give them an idea of what to expect. Okay. And uh, if someone says that you'll be up and down uh, within a few days, it, I think that's a little uh, questionable. Yeah. You know, one of the things we do at the medical center, we have uh, the Heart Patient Support Network. Um, it's something that um, we get patients who have had heart disease or any kind of procedure. Um, they meet on Monday evenings. The next meeting is February 27th. Uh, then they meet March 26th, April 23rd, and June 25th. Um, we're going to show you some information about this um, on the TV. How important do you think it is for people to go to kind of this kind of support group after having a major cardiac event? I think uh, it helps a, a lot because it, you, you deal with questions, the frequently asked questions. It feels that you're tied into a network uh, right. and a support system, and it certainly helps. It helps in other areas. It helps a lot in cardiac surgery. Right. And have you ever been to this support group? Have you ever seen any of the folks here? Uh, yes. Yeah. yeah. And so we also try to bring the doctors in, and they give them a, a chance to answer questions. And uh, some, some of the people that I actually went to the support group last week just to introduce myself, and the patients were very gratified. The thing they said they liked the, the best is, like, if I had open-heart surgery and you had open-heart surgery, we could talk about our experience, kind of what's happening 30 days afterwards. You know, if I had mine two months before and you were uh, a month ahead of me, then you could kind of tell me kind of what the course of what to expect. And that right. seemed to help them a tremendous right. amount. I mean, that, that helps. Uh, you, you can't put a price tag on that. That's, that's, yeah. uh, that's great. Yeah, yeah. It's really, uh, it's really something. So if, as we were getting to wrap up, we really do have a comprehensive cardiac program at the medical center, and there's really no reason for anybody to go anywhere else. Any other comments about our surgery team? I know you're recruiting another doctor to... We're recruiting, uh, we're expanding our team, uh, and we include all aspects of uh, cardiac surgery, from minimally invasive to uh, complex surgery. If you have a complex surgery, there's no need to go to New York or Philadelphia or anywhere else. Right. I've had 20 years experience with the other, with the, uh, other surgeon that's coming on. He has 20 years experience. Wow, you're both 20 uh, years. So remember we talked about it took you 17 years. So how old were you when you finally started going out on your own? Uh, 35. See, he's only 36 now, so <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Anyway, uh, thank you all for coming. Um, Dr. Krauss, thank you. thank you so much, our you. esteemed uh, chief of cardiovascular surgery. He does a great job at the medical center. Um, if you have questions about uh, anything that we've talked about today, um, please, you're welcome to come to our support group. Um, and um, on behalf of the medical center, thank you, and we'll see you next time.